the garden, Gethsemane. Come pray, come with me to pray, Christ said, and they did. Peter, James, and John, Thomas, Andrew, and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Only one of the twelve was missing, the other Judas, Judas Iscariot. There, in the growing darkness, beneath gnarled olive trees, Christ knelt and poured out his heart to his father. If it is your will, Father, please take this cup from me. And they slept. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, then your will be done. And they slept. Not my will, but your will, O oh God. And still they slept. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. My soul aches with sorrow. Lord, we are here for you. Stay with me a while. Lord, you know we will. Can you not even stay awake long enough to keep watch with me? But Lord, behold, the hour is at hand. Here is my betrayer now. Lord, we acknowledge the times we have failed you, just as the disciples did so long ago in the garden. As the flames are taken away from these candles, so remove our sins from us. We remember your pain as we snuff out yet more of your light. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see a few more people here this morning. Uh, that's exciting. Welcome to you, those at home, wherever you are around the world. Um, just want to continue to invite you to join us in person as you feel it's safe. Uh, we would love to have you back in the sanctuary building. You know, there's nothing like being here in person together. Uh, and being with one another in this beautiful space uh, to worship together. And uh, so we look forward to more and more of you coming back uh, as you are able. Uh, we want to uh, uh, give our sympathies and prayers uh, to the family of Eleanor Miles. Eleanor passed away. Uh, she was a longtime member of this church, uh, 100 years old. So we are thankful for her long life, uh, and uh, we want to pray for her family, for her as well. Uh, and um, we also uh, want to continue to pray for the tremendous grief and suffering around the world. Um, did you hear uh, Fauci was saying at the very beginning, he warned that this is going to be bad, but he said in his mind, he did not think that it would be this bad in the U.S. He did not imagine having 500 deaths, 500,000, um, which is a tremendous loss of life. So let us uh, continue to pray in silence as we have, uh, to pray for Eleanor Miles and her family, and for so many who have lost loved ones in this past year. Let us join in silent prayer for, for them all.
Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. God, our hearts are broken at the pain and suffering and loss of life that has occurred around the world. We seek your mercy and your grace and your life-sustaining presence. Our prayers are with those who are saddened by loved ones gone. We give you thanks for the life of Eleanor Miles. We thank you the way you created her and loved her and the gifts you gave to her and which she shared with us. We ask you to wrap your arms of care around her and bring her healing and wholeness and peace. We pray for others whom we know are suffering. And we give you thanks that we have a future hope that nothing will be lost, that you will rescue us all. And we look forward to that day of entering in to the joy of heaven with all your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, it, it's good to actually see more and more uh, eyes. I haven't seen faces completely yet, but... That day will come. I wonder when we'll be able to go maskless. That'll be nice, won't it? Uh, but it's great to see you all this morning. Uh, so Palm Sunday is coming up uh, in one week. And then we enter into Holy Week. And we will be having Monday Thursday service at 7 p.m. Uh, at Covenant. And you're invited to join us for that service in person, if you like, or live stream. And then Good Friday, the service will be here at 7 p.m. And you are welcome to join us in person for Good Friday service. Or you can watch that live stream. And then Sunday morning, the Triborough Clergy Association will be having an Easter sunrise service. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping for warm weather. Uh, uh, but uh, you're welcome to join us at Lakeview uh, for Easter sunrise service. 6.30, that traditionally starts. Uh, so... Uh, uh, as we prepare our hearts during the season of Lent for, for Holy Week, uh, I hope you will join us uh, for those services. There's other announcements and opportunities for you in the bulletin. Uh, just a reminder, we are planning on participating in Treasure Day. And uh, the one great hour of sharing, I encourage you to consider contributing to that. Uh, if you're looking for ways to help the hungry, uh, uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is also funded by the One Great Hour of Sharing. Uh, and it's really unbelievable the, the, the breadth of ministry that the One Great Hour of Sharing funds. Hunger programs all over the world uh, is funded by that. So if you're looking for ways to help people around the world, that's a great uh, offer and we have envelopes, I, I believe, available for you as well. Uh, if you write a check out and send it to the church here, just make sure you indicate that it goes to one great hour of, of sharing. All right? Let us begin our worship today.
Today's reading is from John 12, 20 to 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a simple grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must first follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is the reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it from heaven and said it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you, Jesus Christ. All right, we want to once again pray for one another and to pray for the many needs of the world. So let us gather around the throne of grace and seek God's help. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and promise that what we ask will be given us. So guide us by your Holy Spirit, that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your love. Creator God, you made all things. In your wisdom and in your love, you save us. We pray for the whole creation. We pray that you would order unruly powers and deal with injustice. so that your children, all people, may freely enjoy the earth you have made. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, so that all may believe and know that you are love and turn to your ways and live to give you glory. Gracious God, we pause now to pray for those whom we know and those whom we love who are in need of healing. We pray for our family members, our neighbors, those who we work with, that you might bring healing in whatever form they need. May it be physical, emotional, or spiritual. Lord, we pray for the nations of this world. That you might guide its leaders 
they might have mercy and compassion for all people. We pray for our own country. We pray that you would end racial prejudice and violence. And that you might help us all to see the value and worth of every person. Lord, we pray for this congregation. We pray for its members. We pray for those who are in pain and dealing with serious illness. We pray for families who are stressed and anxious that your spirit might come and bring them peace and wholeness. God of compassion in Jesus Christ, you cared for those who were blind or deaf. And we all need your healing power. May you help us have faith to believe that all will be well. And that our future is safe and that none will be lost. But all will be brought into your glorious kingdom. May you give us fearless courage and compassion until we realize that day. And we thank you that you gave us the example of Jesus Christ to follow, who was willing to give himself for the sake of others. It is in his great and glorious name and in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I can attest to Jesus does listen to what we ask. And sometimes he grants exactly what we ask for. When I was preparing my children's message for today, I was hoping there were going to be some children here today. <laughs> and when I came into church today, thank you, Jesus. And thank you, little children, for coming to the church. We love having you here. I also want to thank Mr. Blackman, who is going to help me with my children's message today. Out of his kindness, he's going to make it happen. So, happy second day of spring. It's such a glorious time of the year. It's so colorful. And we can attribute all of those colors to our creator who created the sun, the flowers, the birds, the plants, the trees, the ocean, the sky. All of these colors God has used in his palette to show us that we need to be happy. Spring is a happy time of the year. He is so wonderful with color. I actually saw a woodpecker this morning at my bird feeder. And he was a downy woodpecker, and was he gorgeous. I don't know if anyone could really even color a downy woodpecker, but the colors that God gave to that bird were glorious. And birds are actually very smart. They're very smart. God provides shelter for the birds all winter. You hardly see them unless you have a little bird feeder in your backyard or a pine cone with some peanut butter on it and some bird seed, which is always a good bird feeder. They know where to get their food. But now that the grass is turning brown, that's dried grass, the trees are starting to bloom and the flowers are starting to peek out to let you know the colors are on their way. How do birds know how to make a nest? YouTube? I don't think so. <laughs> Where do they get their materials? Lowe's? Home Depot? The famous hardware store on Broad Street? God. God provides everything that they need to make their nest. Now, in the very beginning, they start to gather their dried grass, their twigs, mud, and they start to build their nest until they get it just right. And when it's just right, it's going to look like that. And the mother bird will inspect it because the father bird has been very, very busy building this nest. And if it's just the right size and it's just comfy and it's warm and it's up high away from anybody that would want to hurt the birds, or the babies, then the mother will put her eggs in this beautiful nest that the father, there they are, that the, that the father bird has made. And she will keep those birds, those eggs there until it's time for them to hatch. And when they're ready, they will hatch and we welcome a new family into creation a family that God has given us for free. It didn't cost us a penny, but we have all of these birds. Now, the reason I say that birds are smart, I don't think they can read. Uh, I don't think they can read. But on my house last year, I had this wreath. And there's a little sign on the wreath that says, home is where you build your nest. And there's birds. There's birds coming back and forth, and I couldn't real I didn't realize what they were doing. But at the end of the season, when I took the wreath down, they were smart enough <laughs> to build a nest behind the message that said, "Home is where you build your nest." So when you look out your window, or you go for a walk with your family, look up. Look down. Look all around. Don't miss spring. It is beautiful, and it is a gift from God. 
Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Sheila. Now the question is, did God guide those birds to build that nest so that you could give this children's message to us this morning? <laughs> uh, well, how are we doing in the season of Lent? Um, we are following the lectionary reading, and um, I first of all want to... Uh, to, to mention that uh, this month is the month of March is Women's History Month, and uh, I think uh, it would be good to uh, remember this. Uh, it's been 56 years, uh, no, 1956, the first woman was ordained as a pastor in the Presbyterian Church USA, so that's 65 years ago. So our denomination has had past female pastors for the past 65 years. Um, and uh, I think it's been 116 years since we've ordained women as deacons and uh, 70 or 80 years since we've ordained women as elders. Uh, and so I um, want to be thankful for that. You know, in Galatians 3.28, it says, there is no male and female, there is one in Christ. And I uh, always remember my seminary professor said that the, the, the biggest mistake the church made in its history was failing to follow Jesus' example of having women treated equally. And um, I think that's true. Uh, it's taken us far too long to, to begin to ordain women as pastors and elders and deacons. Um, and uh, we really have to remember to strive for, for this great proclamation in Galatians 3.28. That when we look at each other, in a sense, we don't see male or female. We just see one in Christ. And that we should value each and every person equally, and love each and every person equally. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we are not following Jesus' example uh, in this regard. Uh, but we're making progress. Uh, I'm so glad that my daughter uh, grew up in this age. She's had more opportunities, you know, in just in our lifetime, really, in the U.S. Uh, women have much more opportunities uh, than they did just 50 years ago. So we can be thankful for that. Uh, but uh, I've always been tempted to talk to, we have a few female pastors in our presbytery who were part of that very early group where there were very few women pastors in our denomination. And I've always wanted to find out, you know, what was it like when you first started out? You know, what was your reception? Did you get any any bad looks from any of the uh, Presbyterian people? Uh, I'm sure they had uh, times where, where they had to struggle uh, with kind of responses that we might have seen. But I want to thank those women you know, for being pioneers and being willing to, to go into ministry uh, when it was not popular uh, and it was resisted by a lot of people. So they gave us a, a great future for, for their work, and we want to remember them. Um, so the text for this morning, it talks about a grain or a seed that dies, and it's necessary for that seed to die in order for it to bear fruit. And, Jill, I love the, the spring... Uh, Time is a great time to be planning and for looking for the colors to come up. Uh, we have been planting zinnias and sunflowers in our flower beds the past few years. The zinnias are great because you know they, they stay for so long, for so many months, once they flower. And uh, we like the sunflowers because um, 
the goldfinch will come and peck away at those sunflowers. And last year, um, we had a couple big sunflower plants, probably 10, 12 feet. And I loved watching the goldfinch with their bright yellow and then their black hat that they wore. And they would just chew away at, at that sunflower seed. And it was so much fun to watch them. Uh, but Jesus is actually making a rather startling claim for us that we must die in order to find life. And he actually uses hyperbole to emphasize his point, to, to try to get the point across to us that this is really important. He said, you actually have to hate your life in this world in order to find eternal life. Now, he's not meaning that literally. It's hyperbole. He's exaggerating. But the point is, there is something about the way we live this life that we actually have to die to in order for us to realize eternal life. And it's interesting that the lectionary reading uh, has this same teaching in it that we covered about a month ago. Uh, and the lectionary reading is bringing it up again. This aspect of the spiritual path, which Jesus actually modeled for us on the cross. That is, there's something about us that must die in order for us to find life. This is hard for us. Who wants to have to work through a letting go of a certain aspect of ourselves in order to become something new? This means we have to have the willingness to be radically changed by God. And let's face it, most of the time we don't want this. Um... I mentioned in the earlier service, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus walked in and we could ask questions? What would be the first question you would ask Jesus? Um, I would ask him about Mary Magdalene because I was researching that for uh, Women's History Month. And uh, I would ask him, what was your relationship with Mary Magdalene? <laughs> because uh, there was a text found in 1896 in Egypt that they date back to the second century, and it's called the Gospel of Mary. And it says in the Gospel of Mary, this text that they found, that she was very influential and a leader among the disciples, the 12 disciples. And then there was text found in 1945 in Egypt, in Nag Hammadi. Um, and in one of those texts, titled the Gospel of Philip, it says... Jesus loved Mary Magdalene more than any of the other disciples. So now I'm curious, you know, did the church patriarchy squash Mary Magdalene's actual influence and importance at that time? Uh, so that would be one of the questions I would have. Actually, if Jesus walked in and you ask him a question, chances are he would turn it around and ask you a question back, which would be kind of frightening, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you wanted an answer, and then he just turned it around and had you answer a question. That was a typical way a rabbi taught. You taught by asking questions of your student, and your students had to answer. This is actually scary because we see in the, in the New Testament Jesus doing this. And remember the response he gave to one of the people who came up to him and asked him questions? And he said, if you want to follow me, sell all your possessions, give to the poor, then you can come. So this is why we're frightened sometimes to actually take up the spiritual path because we know in the Bible, Jesus makes these outrageous demands of us as his followers. 
I still don't know how I would respond if Jesus came to me in a dream and said, I've got to sell everything. <laughs> Could you really do it? Would you really wake up and start selling everything? So this is the kind of teaching Jesus is giving us here this morning. That we actually have to die in some form or in some way in order to find life. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that we shouldn't be in such a hurry to save this life that we have right now. I mean, have you been around the past 12 months? <laughs> you realize how unsettling and stressful life can be, this life in this world? Thank goodness, you know, we have brilliant researchers and hospitals, and we have health care today. You know, I don't know what they did 100 years ago. It must have been awful when the pandemic was was around. We should have asked Eleanor Miles, right? She, she would have been, she lived through it, the first pandemic 100 years ago. But thank goodness we have advanced to the point where, you know, we, we, we have this incredible research and the vaccines. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it, that we have all these vaccines available so quickly? Fantastic. Th that gives us tremendous hope. But remember when it first started, what is it, 12 months ago now? Remember there was a period of time where you were in shock and you're thinking to yourself, this can't really be happening. Is this real? You know, is the world really changing like this? Are you kidding me? It was hard to accept that this was happening. It was like bizarre. I often think about that about the dinosaurs. You know, I can't imagine that this was the actual earth that had dinosaurs living on it. I mean, it's not a cartoon book, you know, it's not a child's book. This was actual earth with actual dinosaurs, right? So it was a real thing. And we have to realize that we have this tendency to live in delusion. That we live as if we are permanent beings. As if this life is all there is and all there is going to be. And this is the delusion that is actually costing us life in Christ or life in, with God. Because we make the mistake of thinking this is the way it's always going to be. We're always going to have this life. And so I can spend all my time and energy building fancy houses and trying to get fancy cars because this is the way to live life. This is the way it's always going to be. Well, the past 12 months have shown us that life is temporary and fragile. This life you and I have isn't going to last that long. Now, we want to deny that reality because it brings up fear. And we do not know how to handle that kind of fear. And so we deny it and repress it and try to avoid it. But Jesus is showing us a radically different way to live. And that is to be willing to let go of all of this. And by doing that, we actually discover who we really and truly are. We discover true life. But it takes a radical letting go, a willingness to die to self. This small self that we think we are in this body with these thoughts and these feelings. That's not who we are. That's not our soul. So we need to learn to let go of clinging to this life. Because in clinging to this life, we are actually clinging and holding on to death itself rather than opening up to life. 
with Christ in the Spirit. A couple of examples in the New Testament that are helpful that I keep repeating. In Ephesians, Paul says, Do not fulfill the desires of the flesh, but live in the Spirit. So this is what Jesus is talking about. We need to learn how to hate life in order to find it. And the Apostle Paul says we need to learn how to not fulfill the desires of the flesh, but live in the Spirit. So it's these desires of the flesh that are primarily motivating us day after day. And we just stay focused on these desires of the flesh, and that's what is our whole life. And this is what we need to completely let go of. How many of you have already thought about what you're going to have for lunch while you're listening to this long, boring sermon? You've already started focusing on desires of the flesh. Right? Oh my goodness, a couple days ago, I was in Sam's Club behind a guy. The amount of ribs and shrimp he was buying was unbelievable. And I was just thinking, I hope he's a restaurant owner, because I don't know who's going to eat all that. It was unbelievable. The, the fact that we focus all, and spend so much time and desire with food. And the list goes on and on, right? We're, we're, we're all fascinated by certain things. Some it's clothing. Some people are fascinated and follow the desires of power. And their whole life is focused around how they can wield and use power. I mean, the list goes on and on. The desires of the flesh prevent us from living in the spirit. We have to purify our heart in order to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Greeks came in the text this morning wanting to see Jesus. If we want to see God, We can actually see God. All we have to do is purify our heart. That is no easy task, my friends. Have you ever paid attention to your thoughts and emotions throughout the the day? Did you ever make a list? Imagine if one one of my professors said, imagine if we could data track every thought you have for 24 hours and put it up on a screen for everybody to see. (laughs) Oh my goodness, right? That would be bad. So how do you purify that? Because nobody's in control of it until they have put in a tremendous amount of practice and discipline to purify your unwholesome thoughts and emotions. And it can be done. And this is what Jesus is trying to get us to do. You know, in the early church, they had seven times a day prayer. Actually, it goes back to Judaism. The psalmist says in 119, verse 196 or something, seven times a day I praise thee. In Acts 3, John and Peter are going up to the temple because it is time for prayer at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And the early church carried on this practice of prayer seven times a day. And people were expected to actually come out to the church for prayer seven times a day. If they couldn't make it because they were working or whatever, they were stopped what they were doing at prayer. 6 a.m., 9 a.m., Noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and then come fine when you went to bed. And this was, well, it's in the church history. You can see it all throughout. That's a lot of time in prayer, isn't it? But it takes a lot of time to purify our mind. And then we can actually see God. So this is why we have Lent every year for 40 days to get us to work on our spiritual disciplines. The problem is we we don't 
typically want to spend that much time in prayer. You know, it's amazing what we are willing to spend time on. I, I have always been involved in sports. And uh, the worst time for me was when I was at the University of South Florida, and it was preseason in August, and I was on the soccer team, and we were training twice a day. Have you ever been to Florida in August? <laughs> I, I could not believe how exhausted the body could feel. When we, when we would leave the practice field at the end of the day, after the second practice, we looked like zombies. We were just like walking like this. <laughs> we could barely move. It was so exhausting. But you know, people today think, Oh, any amount of training for sports is fine. Look at some of the practice schedules of some of our little kids. Eight-year-olds, you know, practicing five times a week for, for t-ball or whatever it is. I mean, it's amazing how we accept practice as important in our sports. And yet, spiritually, we are putting in no time at all. We're making no effort. Well, it's up to us, isn't it? Do we want to spend the seven hours a day in prayer, seven times a day in prayer? Do we want to see God? Do we want to realize how life can be in the spirit? Well, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, to use another image of life. St. Teresa of Avila talked about the change that occurs when we are freed and living in the spirit. It's like going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. We don't realize the prison that we are in when we are living in this body, living just living out the flesh. It's like a cramped prison cell that we are in. Paul calls it a metamorphosis in Romans 12, that we can turn into butterflies, that there is this incredible life available to us right now, each and every day, that Jesus is offering to us. As we approach Holy Week, may we devote ourselves to realizing this new life that we have in Christ. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for sending us Jesus to show us the way and to also challenge us to become all that we can be in you. May you motivate us to be willing to change and transform into the image of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Linda. Thanks so much. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.